Welcome to Sound and Vision, conversations with contemporary artists and musicians about the creative process. Here's the host of Sound and Vision, Brian Alfred. Sound and Vision is sponsored by Golden Artist Colors. Based in upstate New York, Golden makes the best art materials you can get. From acrylics to oils, watercolors and mediums, and more, Golden will help you make the best you can make in the studio. Check out their art supplies at your local art store or on goldenpaints.com. Sound and Vision is sponsored by Fulcrum Coffee Roasters. Check out their subscription service where you can have their amazing coffee delivered to your door. Fulcrum keeps me well caffeinated in the studio and on podcasts, and I love the variety of coffee I get and the quality of every bag. Check them out at fulcrumcoffee.com and get 10% off your order by entering the code Alfred Studio when you buy your coffee on their site. Why I Make Art, the Sound and Vision podcast book, is now out. It's 336 pages of images, quotes, artist features, sketches from the guest book, and more. You can buy it anywhere you get books, and it's published by Altelier Editions. The link to purchase the book is on the Sound and Vision website, soundandvisionpodcast.com. Evan Mast is a musician and visual artist based out of Brooklyn. He records his own music under the name Evax and is one half of the band Ratatat. You're hearing his music as we speak. After studying art at Skidmore College, Evan released a solo album as Evax. He then went on to release five records with Ratatat. He returned with an eponymous release in 2021 in which he made videos for each track. He's produced music for many musicians, including Despot, Kid Cudi, Jay-Z, and Kanye. He received a Grammy for his production on Kanye's Donda record. Evan's current show at Bracket Creek Editions is up in New York City until July 16th. The show features two prints and a new video work based on his travels in Pakistan. I went over to Evan's studio in Crown Heights for a talk about finding music before the internet, the value of good instrument, touring the world, writing and producing, making video art, and much more. Here's our conversation. What was that for? That was, uh, I was working with Charlotte Gainsbourg. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. And she's, she has like a really quiet voice. So she's actually like really challenging to record. <laughs> just have to get it really close. Sometimes, like sometimes she sings so quietly that you're just like the preamps all the way up, the compressors all the way up, yeah. and you're like, can we get just a little more volume? <laughs> and that you, are you just producing it, or did you? Um, yeah, I guess so. I don't know. It's still it's a little bit loose right now, but yeah, we've been kind of just exchanging ideas and. She uh, she came here and worked for a while, and then we worked in L.A. for a little while. And then we did more work at Electric Lady here, and then I went over to Paris and did more there. So it's that's fun. It's cool. It's been like it's actually like quite a lot has gone into it at this point, but it's it's quite a slow process too. So I think maybe still have a long ways to go. Um, and there's other producers involved too. I'm not the only one working on it. So did you listen to Serge Gainsbourg? Yeah, at all. Yeah, definitely. That Couleur Cafe, I had that on CD, and I used to play yeah. that a lot. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I feel like I was in college when he kind of had his moment in the U.S., like his resurgence. And yeah, they re- reissued some of those records. Yeah, and they were big. And I, yeah, and I was in like arts. I mean, liberal arts school at yeah. that time. It was just like everybody got super into it, and I was right. no exception. Were you into? Uh, I used to go to thrift stores all the time and get those uh, persuasive percussion records. Oh yeah, you know those. They yeah, had the really cool. They were the all like is beautifully designed, yeah. and occasionally they had like an Albers or something, or there was like yeah. a famous designer who would do the front of them. These really like simple minimalist like yeah. graphic designs on the cover. Yeah, those were really cool. I feel like 
often the music was a little disappointing compared to the artwork. Totally. <laughs> but but, I but every it. once in a while you'd get something like really cool musically too. Yeah, like Enoch Light. Mm. Like that stuff. Like yeah. his orchestra was <laughs> It was a little game showy, but sometimes it was pretty cool. Yeah. I feel like there's a lot of samples to be had in those things, though. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think they're pretty, like, well pillaged for samples already. But That's probably true. I got really into, like, in maybe in, like, junior high, pretty f- way back, I like, going through dollar bins, got got into Herb Alpert. And the and Tijuana like, Brass. Yeah. Those records the, are Those crazy. were, like, ubiquitous. They were in every single dollar bin would have, like, hundreds of Herb Alpert records. Yeah, there was he a reason. sold, like, millions and millions of copies of them, and then it was kind of a passing fad, and then everyone just dropped him off at the Goodwill. Or right. Whatever. But at one point, everyone had a Herb Alpert record. Yeah. Like, my dad had one. But they're, like, there's, like, great songs in there. There know. was something I was listening to recently, and there was a great hook in it. And I was like, what is the sample? And now you could do the who sampled who or whatever on yeah. YouTube. And it yeah. was Herb Albert. And I was like, oh, shit. Mm. Like, I forget what song it was. But it's like that thing where the hook you know so well from yeah. the current song. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, I wonder what that is. And you go back and you're like, oh, my God. Like, I had a phase of that. It might be um, that song. One of his songs, Rise, was sampled by, like, Whoever produced Biggie, one of, one of Biggie's records, because there's a Biggie song. Oh, that's one it. of the biggest Biggie songs has a Herb Alpert. Hypnotize. Song. Yeah, that's, that's it. it. Yeah, yeah. And totally. you're like, <laughs> the the combination of Biggie and Hip and yeah. like Herb Alpert <laughs> is such a funny. Yeah, and that's kind of like late career Herb Alpert too. Like that was like 80s where he's, you wouldn't like notice the sample right away because it's not like a traditional Herb Alpert type of sound. It's not the like right. Tijuana Brass. Yeah, and you gotta wait in that song for that hook. Yeah. It's I think it's deep into the song or something and it's only for a little bit. Yeah. But those are like the gems, I feel like. I mean I w- somebody needs to do like a full length documentary on Herb Alpert. Like apparently he played all the parts on those early Herb Alpert in the Tijuana there was no Tijuana Brass. It was just Herb Alpert and lots <laughs> of other tracks of Herb Alpert. He play all the horns individually and just layer them. That's crazy. I yeah. know zero about Herb Alpert. He and then he after Tijuana Brass, they were like wildly successful. Like yeah. there's I don't think there's been like an instrumental act since that's had that level of success. They were like selling out stadiums like without vocals, which is insane <laughs> but it is crazy after that he started a and m records which became like this massive record label i don't think it exists anymore but they had i don't know what they put out but like huge right. stuff like i don't know he did it he started yeah it? he started it and did that for years and yeah i think he still lives in la and i don't know what he's doing now but he's playing horns on the <laughs> <laughs> hanging out with daryl hall and john oates or something playing yeah <laughs> that's pretty cool um well, so let's, I'm excited to talk to you because, you know, I know some things about you, but I don't know anything about your growing up period, mm. but you do have siblings who are very accomplished and creative too. Some of which who have been on your show. <laughs> that is true. Yes. So I like, what is, how did that family happen? <laughs> I don't know. That's, we get that question a lot and it's a bit of a mystery because my, growing up, my dad was a salesman. He worked for a lawnmower company. Oh, that explains it. International. (laughs) (laughs) He did like international sales for MTD lawnmowers. So he was like, when I was growing up, he spent half his time traveling around the world. world Oh, he's a traveling salesman. Yeah. He used to go to Australia, New Zealand every year, South America, and spent a lot of time in Europe. And and then my my mom, like kind of just took care of us when I was a kid. But then like later on, she started doing like accounting, doing people's taxes. She worked at H&R Block. Um, and now my dad's kind of doing some accounting as well and still like some business stuff. I mean, they're, they're he's like semi-retired at this point, but. Yeah. When well, this is West Coast, yeah. right? No, Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, Ohio? Yeah. Yeah. So we were like that. 20 minutes outside of Cleveland and then my grade school was in Cleveland. So we'd do that drive every day. Um, yeah, so I lived there till I was 17. Yeah. Well, I wasn't that far away. Yeah, Pittsburgh, right? Yeah. And a Steelers fan, sorry. <laughs> Were you a Browns fan? I mean, I guess, I think I tried to be. I wasn't, I, I, I never really got into sports. Like, right. I think it was like, it was a difficult thing to not be into sports in grade school, so I think I really like gave it a go. But Of course. Just, it's it provincial. Didn't, didn't come naturally to me. Yeah, yeah, but even in provincial towns, I feel like, 
yeah. you're exposed to or the culture is just there yeah, like in pittsburgh yeah. heavy yeah you the steelers were just it you know what i mean totally and you yeah. whether you liked it or not like my brother is not a sports fan at all like i don't feel like he's not really big into sports but he knows the steeler like he knows that culture you know just from yeah. being around it so yeah it was yeah i mean it was everywhere growing up like the browns and the indians and the indians were like the butt of every joke because they like hadn't won in a game oh, in like yeah. 20 years yeah. i don't know it was like they made like that whole movie with charlie sheen oh my God. based off of how bad the indians were major, <laughs> major league is that what it's yeah called? i think th- yeah that was a good movie <laughs> <It's crazy. laughs> yeah yeah cleveland and it was such a it's funny because uh you know, I have the relationship I have with Cleveland is basically from a distance of just knowing that that's like a rival town or something. Mm. But then when I started playing music and we're, or going to see shows, we would go to Cleveland because there was always, it wasn't that far. And you could, if yeah. you really like someone who came through Pittsburgh, you could go see him again in Cleveland. Right. Yeah. So I would do that a lot. And then sometimes Philly, but Cleveland was closer. Yeah. I would think that, yeah, Philly probably got better shows than Cleveland. I mean, we would get we would get some like the tours would half the time not stop in cleveland and half yeah the time. Oh, really? <laughs> so. yeah the ones that well yeah i guess I don't, I don't really remember that much but i remember going to see you know bands like like ride or lush or like mm. those shoegazer bands would go yeah. there that i was into and um and then like post-rock stuff after that you know yeah we'd go through cleveland we'd go when i was in college at penn state we would if we really liked a tour like i remember seeing tortoise the sea and cake and five style and they played in Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and then Philly. And we went to all three shows. Oh, we nice. Were really into that show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was kind of like a music. My relationship to that town was just, you know, knowing music stuff. Yeah, totally. But growing I, up, were you? Yeah, I was super into it. I mean, I was kind of just scrounging for like any bit of culture I could find there. We would, so my grandparents lived in California. We'd go out to the Bay Area every summer for like a week or two and then get a little bit of taste of like like what's happening on the coast and like oh and i my my whole childhood is like so much better there why don't we move there (laughs) everybody skateboards is like really fun yeah yeah (laughs) then come back to ohio and i'm like man (laughs) it's dreary weather's kind of gray a lot you know yeah 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 and there was just like nothing to do like I mean, there would there would you get those shows occasionally, like little things like that. We'd get like really excited about a show and yeah. like look forward to it for two months or something, and then, um, yeah. I mean, I I would yeah, I was just kind of like really scrounging to find anything interesting to do in Cleveland the whole time. And, yeah. What about record shops? There was, there, there was a couple I'm good to shops. Think of what the one was. There was so you probably went to the Grog Shop, of course. Yeah. So the, down the street there was one or maybe two record stores there. Um, I forget what they were called, but, but you when, probably if I ever went to shows at the grog shop, then I would always stop and I'd go like an hour early to go to the record store or whatever. Yeah. I can't um, even remember the ones in Pittsburgh I used to go to, but there was one in Squirrel Hill that was really big. Mm. Um, but yeah, those record shops were like, you know, kind of everything. That's where you would go. Yeah. You know, there was nothing, there's no digital, nothing. It was, that's where you got it, you know? Totally. Yeah. And they used to have NME or like magazines like that where, you could find out stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you would find out if someone's yeah. like getting reviewed or a new record's coming out. Right. And then, yeah, you, like you'd find out like six months later or something because it would just right. take a while for trickle it to trickle down. down. <laughs> People in like New York would already be sick of it and you'd be like, wait, there's a new so and so right here. Like, yeah. Well, I guess tours too would subject you like opening acts and stuff was yeah. a way to like find out about people, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Like the first time you're introduced to someone is through a live show. It's kind of nice. Yeah. And then at some point, I mean, there was like the, the handful of like decent record shops and you, you'd have to go like once a week or something cause they'd get different stuff in and then they'd sell out. And right. if you weren't like keeping up on it, you might miss your chance to get something cool. Or, but yeah. then like eventually like borders books opened. Do you remember borders? Oh yeah. It, it was like magazines and music. And it was like not as far as like Coventry, like where the grog shop was and those right. cool record stores. So I could go there and I figured out that like, you could ask them to order like any CD oh, and nice. that would take like two weeks or something, but they would eventually get it. So then I was like, you know, would find something in the magazine and be like, Oh, 
I want to get that Order record that. and put in the order, wait two weeks, then go back, pick it up. And like, it's crazy the speed of that. Yeah, totally. If I think about my kid having to wait two weeks for something, for like music, he's yeah. like, no way. Like, no, it's like I can barely wait 10 seconds anymore. <laughs> when, <laughs> when that new Kendrick record yeah. came out, like it was instantaneous. Like as soon as it hit the digital platform, it was like, listen, listen, listen. It was just yeah. like on repeat. And I remember just like waiting you would see a record date and then think, okay, I'll go to the store. Hopefully they'll get it. And you just have to keep going back and back and back. And yeah, totally. Different. Did, and then you, you, did you did you also skateboard? Yeah. Or hang around? Were you skateboard adjacent? I was, I, super, like that was, I was super into it, like junior high, into high school. But I, I was terrible at it. But I was like, I think I was drawn to the culture yeah. of it more than anything. Right. Um, like I would just like i remember junior high just like sitting there for hours like skimming through skateboard magazines or even just the like catalogs that had the little tiny images of every yeah the graphics on the decks so just spend like all day looking at those things that was fun like yeah. thrasher and trans world and all that stuff yeah but i feel like i was like music and skateboarding kind of went hand in hand like i would yeah. find out a lot about that because yeah. i was kind of into you know a little bit of alternative or hip like the early like rap stuff but then I had a friend who was really into he was like this skateboarding group that was really into like Black Flag and like mm. all the punk stuff that I didn't really know or listen to much. Yeah. But they kind of exposed me to that side of it. Yeah, it was always like the two there was the two threads in the skateboarding, the like punk side and the hip hop side. Yeah. Especially like into the like the ninety a little bit like later on. It was really like the kind of two separate lanes. Sometimes they were segregated. Like certain yeah. kids were like, Oh, that we don't listen to that. I've always yeah. been like a lover, like a I never really wanted a boundary music, even when I was younger, because I would just get into that and get into the other stuff. Mm -hmm. But then there was like this cool factor that when you're young, you kind of pay attention to a little bit. Because yeah. I remember liking reggae music. I thought it was really interesting. And like I had a friend who was like, Dude, that's like the worst. Like, why would you <laughs> listen to that? And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. Yeah. And it took me like years to actually be able to to say like oh th this Come is really around. good <laughs> i was right all along this yeah, was cool <laughs> like it's cool and the, the music means something you know like it yeah. felt but but it was panned off as like this like meaningless music that all sounds the same or something yeah yeah, yeah it's funny how that that stuff used to be so important those like genre barriers were right. so respected and people's whole identity was like wrapped up and they really belonging can't. to this one subset yeah but, like they really yeah. can't like I had a group of friends who were into the cure and like they found out that I listened to public enemy and I remember feeling like oh I gotta hide that like I mm. can't yeah <laughs> it's like a weird thing to do it's now funny, I feel like yeah, it's open it's just it was so tied up in people's identities like I remember there was there was like a whole group of kids in my high school that were just obsessed with nine inch nails who they're from cleveland too so it was even like a bigger thing like nine inch nails was massive in, in the high school especially with like a certain type of kid and i was always like i don't like I, they weren't like my close friends or something so i had something against nine inch nails and i was just like oh it belongs to that group <laughs> right that I, like i don't know i don't know what they're all about and so i always like kind of hated nine inch nails and then just like last year i like heard one of their songs and i was kind of got interested and so like revisited some of the records and i was like these are really cool it's pretty good yeah, <laughs> yeah like, <laughs> held something against these guys for decades but it's pretty good right yeah <laughs> like he was actually on to something yeah yeah there's like really interesting production decisions in those songs i think yeah so all right so you guys are growing up in cleveland you're searching for culture and then in high school yeah. was that were you playing any music with people or what you know, was yeah. art? How was art and music kind of introduced in? I mean, I think art happened so young that I don't really even remember where it came from. I was just, just like drawing, always into drawing and yeah. painting and whatever was around. Music started maybe like ten or eleven. I like started taking guitar lessons. Um, it was like one day to the next. Just got really in interested in guitar. Like I'm, there was a guy in our church that played guitar, and he showed me a couple things like after church one day and i was like huh that's interesting how that works <laughs> like and then my dad like had brought back a guitar from mexico that i think he just got it at like a tourist like souvenir shop it was like b barely it wasn't like a real instrument it was like a toy right it was like impossible to tune and like impossible to do anything but i like struggled with trying to play guitar on this thing thinking that's just how it was for like a while 
started taking lessons and then eventually got like a guitar that worked and i was like oh so that's what it's <laughs> that's what it's all about like right I, you know like you can actually hit notes that make melodies <laughs> it's probably good though to get that start on something that's yeah non-functional so you just like <laughs> when you get the real thing like i remember my first skateboard was a little we called them banana boards because they were plastic and yellow oh yeah the yeah. wheels were huge and it was just like a little weird shape like a little mini surfboard you yeah. couldn't ollie on it there was no tail so i didn't i couldn't figure yeah. out what am i supposed to do on this thing it was like 70 yeah they were impossible yeah. to ride and yeah. if you hit a rock there was like you're gone you're done yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i basically didn't understand and then when my friends started getting like skateboard like i I realized, oh, you can get ones that actually work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, having the right tools for the job it makes a huge difference. It really does. <laughs> yeah, the first, I got really excited. The first um, guitar that I got, I was begging my parents for a guitar, and they got me it as a gift, and it was this black guitar. I don't know what, it was probably from like Kmart or something, and it had like a mini amp in it. Oh, nice. And I thought <laughs> at the time, I was like, oh, it's so not cool. You yeah. <laughs> and it didn't really sound good at all. Like, I'm sure yeah. the thing was never in tune. Right. Nor would I know how to tune it. Yeah. <laughs> so it just felt like I can't figure this out, you know? Yeah. And then you you realize, oh, there's like real versions of this. <laughs> yeah. They work. Yeah, it's funny because now, I mean, now you'd go on YouTube and just like yeah. moments later you would have it all figured out <laughs> yeah it's, it, it's it used to be like it would take months and years sometimes to like realize these things <laughs> right and you also realize how nice of stuff you can get like yeah. instantly yeah you know the bar is set high real at a really early point i feel like yeah totally because we didn't i didn't even know what a gibson guitar was for a long time you know i just knew that there were some that actually seemed to work yeah <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't have, like, enough money or time to, you know, I didn't really go to the guitar store that often. Because it was intimidating at that point in my life. Yeah, you yeah, know? definitely. So it's just like, what are my friends doing? And you just kind of get the feeling from them, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, but, every little bit of information, it was so impressionable because you didn't have access to that much. Right. Like, one guy who you looked up to said, like, this is the kind of guitar that is cool. Then you were just like, well, that's... That's the only cool guitar. Then. Sounds good. <laughs> I'm on board. That's yeah. really how it worked. That was, I mentioned that before. That's like going to graduate school when I was in college. Same thing. Mm -hmm. There was no internet to research really. So it was just like, oh, here's the three you should apply to. All right. Yeah. <laughs> no research. It's not like I was going to be able to fly around and visit all these schools or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, like times have changed with that stuff. Yeah. But totally. did the, uh, the, gu the guitar lessons kind of like, I don't know, unlock something or was it still, yeah. did you kind of catch the bug at that point of like, Oh, I really like to do this. Yeah, definitely. Like I got pretty into it pretty quickly. My first teacher was this guy called Robert Reese, who was like a, he was like a old, like blues guy. Like he, he played a guitar that was just like BB King's guitar and he kind nice. of looked like BB King himself too. But he was like, I think he was like self-taught. Like he, I didn't, find out till like years later but like really basic stuff like how to hold the guitar properly like i was doing all wrong <laughs> <laughs> and he like never pointed these things out to me which is actually in retrospect is fine but he like he was big on improvising so he would a lot of the, a good part of the lesson each week would be like one of us would be playing chords and the other one would be like soloing in a scale and that was just something that he taught me like really early on like how to improvise it's pretty cool and i was always like way more interested in that than learning a song like right. sometimes we'd like learn a beatles song or something and i was like i didn't have that much patience for it like you know if my homework was to like come back and be able to play the song i might like skip it entirely but like whenever <laughs> it came to like the the writing or improvising like creating something new that was like what i was super drawn to that's advantageous because i feel like most tutors or like you know people who give lessons are very analytical in the beginning yeah it's like you have to learn scales it's like all boring and that turns off so many people because yeah. they're just like i don't want to sit here and you know have to it's like homework yeah yeah definitely your guy was like just have at it like go to town yeah and he'd kind of just give you like the, the framework and be like yeah this is sort of like the basic i mean i guess it in a way it was kind of music theory but just you know just some tiny little early pieces of it um but was he giving you like blues structure yeah he'd give me like these are the patterns these are the scales and like this is this will work with this these chords and 
Yeah, it was a lot of blues stuff for sure because that's kind of the easiest thing to do on guitar. So, well, what were you? Place to start. Were you? You probably weren't listening to a lot of blues in high school, though, right? No, I got into like a little bit. Maybe like I remember getting like some Mississippi John Hurt records and I don't know a couple of things. But yeah, I was way more into like I don't know punk and Red Hot Chili Peppers and stuff like that. Right. I don't know. Which all yeah. kind of comes from the blues anyways. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how that works, right? <laughs> you know, like listen to old like Skip James or Robert Johnson. You're like, oh, there's something in this that just never left. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. That kind of like rock and roll or any of that stuff. Yeah. Or punk. It's, just it's, like the, it's the root know, of all of that for sure. It really is. Yeah. It's kind of like a motion. It, it's that, you know, the narrative of trying to get out that feeling. Yeah. It's interesting. So that's a cool way to start it up. Did you get end up getting into like a high school band or anything, or were you just playing uh, on your own? I had like friends that that were into music, and we'd like jam together, and yeah, we'd kind of like start bands, but nothing ever really went anywhere. We played some like battle of the bands at high school, a couple of those kind of things, but um, more the direction it ended up going more was like I bought a four track, and then I would just like record songs in my room and just I don't know. We just kind of like slowly started collecting instruments from like thrift stores and stuff and we just and I was really got really into like a lot of the like lo-fi indie rock stuff that was happening at the time um so I was just trying to like do my own version of Sebado and the early oh, Beck yeah. records and all, all that kind of stuff so you sat in your room you got recording equipment and surrounded yourself with instruments yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah common thread not <laughs> too far off you made it work yeah <laughs> <laughs> well what what when it came to school though i mean what was the plan because you know i mean you went you uh, were saying that tried it was to spend as little arts, time as right? possible there yeah <laughs> it was just you had kind of had to go to school so yeah i mean i i i, I left high school after three years and because there was a guy in the year ahead of me who did that who just like went to college after the third year and and I remember seeing him like the last day of school and he was like, oh yeah, so I'm not going to see you again because I'm going to college. And I was like, you can do that. You just <laughs> You're a junior, early. you can do that. <laughs> I was like, so I got the idea. I was like, damn, because I, I hated high school. So I was like, all right, there's a way to get out of here a year early. So then I I just applied to college my junior year and got in somewhere and so went for it. Wait, you didn't have to do like any accelerated learning or anything or no testing I had, or what? I mean, I had like covered all my requirements um, but my, I went to this like kind of uptight college prep high school and it was, it just wasn't my scene at all. I like, wasn't into it. So I did all the credits thinking I could just like get my diploma and get out of there. But they decided that they weren't going to give me the diploma and they didn't really have any good reason. They were just like, uh, you can leave, but we're not going to give you a diploma. <laughs> so, <laughs> but at that point it didn't matter. I'd already gotten into college. I was like, all yeah, right. you're going to get the college diploma. Yeah. And they the college didn't seem to care. Maybe they didn't know that I didn't have a high school diploma. I don't know, but it somehow I got through. <laughs> That's cool. Well, d was it weird go or not weird? Was it a difficult transition going to college a little early? Uh, no, it was, it was great. I mean, I, I felt like things were kind of, I mean, I'd, it felt pretty sheltered in Ohio at that point. And so, I mean, I went to school at Skidmore, upstate New York, small town. It's also like pretty sheltered, but there was kids from a lot of kids from New York city and some from like LA West coast. It was just like suddenly exposed to like all these different people. My high school was tiny too. There was like 40 kids in my class. Whoa. So going to, how'd like, you know about Skidmore? My brother and sister both went there. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> how did they know? Uh, I don't know. I'm I, always curious how people find out, like, pre-internet. Like, yeah. How people, f maybe they knew someone or heard about it, you know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Because Skidmore is not exactly, like, you know. Yeah, it's not, like, super well Like, known. Ohio State or something, where it's, like, jammed down your neck, you know. Yeah. You just know all about it. And it's it. pretty small. I think there was, like, 2,500 kids there. Yeah. So somehow my brother came across it. I don't know. But I used to go visit him when he was, he's five years older than me. So he, when he was in school, I'd go visit him and hang out. And I was just like, oh, I like it here. It was like I'll do this. People. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what, I mean, I guess Skidmore could be a place where you could kind of do your thing and, you know, it's, yeah. it's probably not, it feels like it would be a little more open 
than maybe some other places in a way. Sort of, yeah. It was. I mean, it's like a liberal arts school, so there was a whole there was a lot of requirements outside of art that I had to do there. And I guess the thinking was, right, I wasn't like fully committed to doing art, maybe yet. I don't know. But when I got basically, I just ended up going straight into like spending all my time in the studio and yeah. making art the whole time. And I definitely had these other classes, but I'm not sure I really put enough into them to get much out of the other classes. Right, it was right. like all about being in the studio and yeah. And did your, did your sister go there for art as well? She, she did, did right? yeah. And your brother? Yeah. Yeah. Well, she's, she's still making and doing it. Totally. Yeah. She's, she's in Paris right now doing a project some kind of performance nice so, yeah yeah so when you graduated what was the plan um i didn't have much of a plan when i graduated <laughs> a lot of my friends moved to new york and i think i wasn't i decided i wasn't ready to live in new york i was still like intimidated by new york yeah so i ended up going and staying at my parents house for a couple months in the bay area um and then my brother had a room open up in his house in Portland, like the, his roommate moved out or something, and it was like 200 bucks a month or something. And I was like, I can, probably, I can figure that out. <laughs> what year was that, roughly? <laughs> that was probably like 2000, maybe like fall or something. So is this is this when the genesis of uh, Audio Drag started, or was it before that? Uh, that was already happening. Yeah. Eric had started that when he was still in college, Oh, wow, went that far back. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then when he was, his whole, like, early time in Portland, he was putting out records under Audio Drags. So then, I guess my, so my record on Audio Drags, the parking first lot e music. Parking Lot Music, yeah, that came out, I think, 2000, early 2001. Well, when did you start writing your own stuff, though? Were you doing it in school? In school, yeah. yeah. So you always kind of had that going on, but you were also doing art stuff. yeah. Yeah, and and music was really the hobby on the side that I, I, like the idea of having a career in music seemed so improbable that I never gave it any thought beyond that. It well, it still like, does, doesn't it? Like, yeah, and in art, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, it's kind of like yeah. I guess for, for some reason, art seemed more. I could grasp that more. I was like, oh, I because I, I didn't think I would be like a showing in galleries and making a career that way. Really, I. I got into end of school. I got really into graphic design. Even, I didn't take any dra graphic design classes, but I just took an interest in it and kind of learned how to use all the software and stuff. So there was a period of time where I was doing graphic design after school to like pay the bills, and that seemed viable. Yeah. Um, so when you were in Portland, you were kind of making music. You're yeah. doing, were you doing some design stuff? I was doing some design. I was trying to find a job in design there, but like nobody was hiring anywhere. Um, so it, it only lasted a couple of months in Portland. Um, it was really fun. Like some of the friends that I made out there are still really close friends. And, yeah. Um, and it was cool to have that, that time with my brother. Um, but after a while, yeah, I was just like, this isn't working. What am I, I going to do? <laughs> right. And then it was like the same thing similar situation where it was like a friend of a friend had a room open up in new york and i was like huh. was that how it happened yeah it was like hey we got a spot yeah and it was also like a couple hundred bucks a month um because it was in crown heights and nobody was moving to crown heights at that time so <laughs> yeah <laughs> so like a little went, more affordable back then yeah went straight to crown heights from jfk and with a bunch of boxes of stuff and yeah. set up shop yeah and I've, I've, had, I've moved apartments like three times since then, but they've all been on the same street. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. So it's been a while in the neighborhood. Yeah. The neighborhood has changed. Yeah. it's. Un I mean, it's New York. Unrecognizable I mean, to what everything. it used to be. I, you know, my first yeah. place was in South Williamsburg, mm. which at that point, it wasn't too bad, you know? Yeah. I mean, it was a little iffy yeah. down there, but it was fine. But I mean, now... Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a whole different thing. It's really changed. Yeah, you know, my, my I used to live where I worked in the Gretsch building, like one of oh, the okay. you know how the Gretsch had like five factory buildings. Yeah, and um, and I was into one right off the Williamsburg Bridge. Oh, okay, which was really cool. At that point, mm. I I bought a guitar. I found a guitar at uh, 
I forget the name of the store. It was on Bedford Avenue. But it was uh, a Gretsch, like a 57 Gretsch single anniversary. And it was oh. made in the building where I was sleeping. So I oh, felt like, crazy. oh, this is, yeah. I got to get it. You know? <laughs> and, That's uh, really cool. And still have that guitar. But it was, you know, that building was so raw. And yeah. it was just like a bunch of artists on one side. And the other side was like jewelry makers. And, you know, mm. it was just like that kind of thing. And then at one point they just kicked us all out. You yeah. Know? They were like, it's time to go. And then it became super luxury apartment, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's how it goes. That's, I think they were trying to do the same thing in my old studio building. They were, but they, I don't think it was a desirable enough building for them to fully pull it off. So they were like converting the studio spaces like one at a time into yeah. luxury apartments. But then it would be like a luxury apartment in a weird building where there was like artists walking in and out the whole <laughs> right. time. It was like, didn't uh, work. You got to go all in. Or yeah. This yeah. Isn't work. You can't phase that in. Yeah. <laughs> it's not that luxurious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but it seems like you left Portland when port, I mean, it was a, I mean, from a, from a distance from mm. the outsider. Cause I, you know, wasn't there, but it felt like fertile music art territory. Like it felt like there was, yeah. but at maybe that, that was just on the outside when you're there, you're like, ah, this isn't really working. At that time it was like, there was definitely like some music coming out of Portland. There was, there were some things happening. Um, but my experience was that like, it, it, it was just very slow paced and I was like right out of school and I was like, where to go? go. And yeah. there was a lot of people that like had bands and stuff, but it was, it seemed like everybody was just like in their basement smoking weed. Yeah. Well, that's the thing about, I feel like provincial towns, they can catch a little bit of fire, but it, yeah. you feel like you can kind of understand and read or, or like you just know it. Yeah. Whereas if you go to like New York or LA, maybe even, well, Chicago is pretty provincial too. It's just like, it just feels bigger than you'll ever be able to, comprehend Mm -hmm. like there's always going to be new stuff new people new things yeah and there's an energy it's exhausting but there's also an energy to it yeah there's definitely like pros and cons to the whole thing i mean the cool thing about portland was if you go to you went out to shows you were going to see the same like small group of people every time so every time you like went out to do anything you would like see your friends or whatever and like in new in new york like if you were going to you would have to like make plans to go to the show with a friend if you were going to see the friend. Like right. you were going to, I don't know. At least even today, I feel like I rarely like run into people randomly. It's like you're, yeah, you're making plans to do the same thing, or you're not going to see him. Um, yeah, it's true, and you feel like there's for some reason that translates in like opportunity or so, or you know, mm-hmm. you may bump into someone that you don't know, and then it turns into something. Or yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, so much happens just because of that kind of organic thing. And but I remember, do you, but do you, you since going to the school in upstate and being from you know Cleveland, mm-hmm. do you feel like now that you've kind of established yourself to a certain extent of you know making music and you know working with people and doing these things that do you ever feel the draw to maybe go build a studio out somewhere quiet or do you still need that energy? Uh, I don't know. It's a good question. I feel like every couple of years. I start to think like, um, do I really need to be in New York anymore? Like, is, am I getting enough out of this to warrant like the expense and all the inconvenient things? Well, COVID also <laughs> COVID yeah. kind of amplified that. It's like, yeah, totally. when there's no Broadway, there's no restaurants, there's no culture really. Yeah. Everything's shut down and you're like, and I'm paying what I'm paying to live here. It's like, yeah, oof. I think everybody kind of had that moment of, yeah. Like, <laughs> what is what is the reason like why am i paying all this a lot of people a lot of people split too yeah yeah i i split for a couple months (laughs) yeah smart (laughs) yeah it was but yeah even without covid though i think i still sort of like stop and reevaluate but i I think i like new york the most when i get an opportunity to leave every few months or something and then yeah you hit the reset button yeah and then it it kind of renews my interest i'm happy to come back and like remember all the things i like about it but I don't know. I think I'm always kind of like, well, maybe is there another place I could, I would rather live. And I'm every couple of years, I'm like, what I, what if I lived here? What if I lived there? But I can never really come up with a viable answer of a place that would be better. I have a lot of complaints about New York, but I still think maybe it's, it still might be the best. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's like, until you find that place that you think, Oh, I could do this over. Yeah. You know, anywhere you go, you'll feel after like a couple months, you'll be like, Oh my God, I got to get back. Yeah. <laughs> 
and I, and I don't have like kids or anything too. I think if I had a, so many of my friends, like as soon as they had kids moved out of the city. Oh yeah. It's for, a test just cause for, for practical reasons. But I don't think it's, it's also like your life becomes so much about caring for your kid and stuff right. that you don't have as much time to like take advantage of all the cultural stuff anyway. So yeah, that's definitely a factor. Yeah. And the only thing that's crazy, like as someone who, you know, I grew up in Pittsburgh, which is a city, but you know, mm-hmm. it, I don't know. You can do it. It's not like overwhelming or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but like having a kid and thinking about you, you'll get that thought of like, Oh, having grass and like woods to run around in and stuff would be so nice. But then like all yeah. the stuff that they can see and experience in the city is pretty amazing. Yeah. So it's really kind of like grass is greener sort of thing. Totally. Yeah. I think that I've definitely, I have a couple of friends. I think I've done it really well who have like raised their kids in New York and like, you know, we're taking them, to museums when they were like babies kind of thing and they like kind of grew up they're just like very advanced at this point like kids that are like in their early teens but like know more about like art and music and culture than even i do now so (laughs) yeah no that happens and then the parents have advanced gray hairs from raising a kid in the city (laughs) yeah it it can be a lot for sure but it is incredible i mean you know every time i think Mm -hmm. about leaving you know, I don't go out to see that much live music. I'm here where it's all the time. It's happening yeah. constantly. But, you know, and I can go just on a whim, go to the Met, which is pretty great. You know, yeah. that. but yeah. I don't do it a lot because I'm so busy with the day-to-day stuff. But there is yeah. that just knowing that I can if I want to. Yeah, you know? totally. Yeah, the, I mean, I think those are the moments that kind of really stop and be like, oh, I'm so glad I live in New York. When, right. Yeah, I spend the day at the museum like randomly or... But also, like, I mean, I guess for my work, too, it's nice to to be in a place that, like, everybody comes through New York at some point. So, yeah. like, just being here, so-and-so is in town, some artist that I want to work with is in town and reaches out. I'm like, hey, well, Stop I'm over. just over the bridge. Like, yeah. Let's meet up. Yeah, but you also, uh, I don't know if you've been doing it recently, but you usually would travel a lot, I imagine. Yeah. So you're also yeah. getting that. Like, you're getting out. You're going and going yeah. all over and then you come back and reset you know totally, so you're not yeah. here just like every single day you know yeah the traveling is is definitely a an important piece of the puzzle for me so yeah and it seems inspiring visually for you yeah definitely yeah like all the all the video work that i've been doing is based off of traveling yeah um so that's i mean i i spent so many years touring as well and there you're traveling but it was pretty rare that we got a chance to like actually experience a place right. they're just always in a club somewhere and, yeah it's like you know, stop like, to stop basically. the first time i went to thailand i was there for like not even 48 hours and i was and like a day and a half of that was like inside a club <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> i had been wanting to go there forever and i was like oh man this is like can't even a, see it yeah, yeah. <laughs> had a couple like good meals or whatever but it was like all right i really got to come back here <laughs> yeah and that's the, it, it's almost worse in a way because you get teased because you yeah. you're visually stimulated by it but you can't like just go out and yeah. hang out you know i remember the first couple of times i went to japan it was like oh my god it's amazing but it wasn't that long you know what i mean and then when i started going for like long trips yeah that's when you really get to see like when you go outside the city and travel and spend more time it's it's nice yeah yeah whenever i've been traveling recently i've tried to do longer and longer trips because there's always that like feeling of like arriving in a place and if you know you only have 10 days or something it's like this date is looming in the distance you're like ah there's like way too much that i want to do and only so many days to do it or whatever but yeah, I think the the longer you have, the more you can like really get into the rhythm of a different place. And yeah, I'm always amazed that when you see those tour dates, I'm like, holy crap, you guys, yeah. <laughs> like whoever it is, it's just every night. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know if it's maybe they have families to get back to or they the promoters is like stacking them but i'm like that's there's no downtime I mean, I think at it's all. A, it's a money thing really. Like yeah. those those overseas tours, it's Unless you're playing like giant venues, it's really hard to make money because there's just so many expenses. Oh, the overhead, right? If you're not getting like a guarantee every night, it's like pretty tough to make it work. So it's crazy because with, um, you know, the conventional wisdom now is like the money musicians are really going to make is through touring or merch, right? Because the record label thing, it seems yeah. as though 
you know, streaming doesn't really pay that well. No, it doesn't. But um, then record labels, didn't they? I mean, in, in the sense of like more major labels, I guess they usually probably nickel and dime artists out of everything, anyways, right? So it seems like yeah. it's a tough go. It's, de- it's definitely tough, and it's like, yeah, I think everybody's kind of struggling to figure out how to make it work these days. But then there's a lot of people that are like circumventing the whole label system that are making right. that work too. So I don't, I don't know. I think there's there's definitely opportunities now. The streaming thing is is really difficult because it's basically they decided that music isn't valuable. <laughs> right. It's like <laughs> so, basically free. And it's really hard to come back from it. Once everybody gets used to not really paying for music or paying a couple bucks for the entire history of music. Right. It's like, how are you ever going to convince them to not do that anymore? Yeah. I mean, um, I admit in those early days, I dipped into audio galaxy there for a minute. And I was like, <laughs> wow, this is kind of incredible. Yeah. I was really into the live stuff that you could find. You could find like a mm. square pusher live show on there. I was like, whoa, <laughs> we could normally not get this. And it's just like, yeah, you know, but then Apple came in and it's like, oh, okay, I guess now people will pay for music again and then everything yeah. will be back up. And then you realize they don't pay the artists much. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is there. It's weird. It's, and then it's funny, like vinyls having this resurgence and I think, it's somewhat like I feel like a lot of people just like buy the vinyl just to like support the artist or just to like have, hold it, have something. Yeah, but it's then a, they're probably like an like, art object. They're probably listening off of Spotify anyway to the right. same album, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's like the well, it's the, probably like a T-shirt from the tour or something. Yeah, you yeah, know? totally. Well, I was here, like I got it, I got the thing. You yeah, know? yeah. But yeah, the way that the the architecture of the way that we engage with communication and media. That just makes sense that people are just gonna listen on their phone to everything, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. to to compartmentalize it takes like effort. Yeah, you know, in a way that people just aren't into that anymore. Yeah, it's the convenient thing is always gonna win. <laughs> I got rid of my record collection when I moved to New York because I knew I'm never gonna have like space for this. This is gonna yeah. be a pain in the ass to always have to try to figure out where I'm putting this stuff. Yeah, you know, because and I was moving in with like five other people in a loft where you know who knows what's going to happen to it i was like i just can't commit to that anymore you know and then i remember getting rid of my cds which were boxes and boxes of these things you know it's pretty yeah i went through i I got rid of the cds a couple years ago finally and it and i don't it was was such a weird thing i had so many like memories tied into all these albums and stuff like going through all of them and like deciding to get rid of them was kind of a weird moment <laughs> i know it's been like decades building up this collection and then all of a sudden it's basically worthless <laughs> <laughs> i know and you used to you know spend i mean you know it's a, when i looked at my cd collection when i boxed it up i was like each one of those like 10 bucks that's a pretty good yeah. financial investment you yeah. know and a lot of those cds i couldn't preview them so i just bought them based on the cover and they weren't that great yeah <laughs> so you know it was like gambling. But I, also, I appreciated that though too because then if you spent 10 bucks 12 bucks on a, an album even if it wasn't good you're gonna listen to it like three times to Definitely. make sure it's not good right right and then maybe some of the songs start to grow on you and then some of those albums become your favorite albums <laughs> the ones that you didn't think you liked the first listen totally that so, happened to me like i would yeah. even even at other music when i would read the description I'd be like, oh, that sounds like something I'd like. And I'd go home and I was like, mm, I don't know. Yeah. But then you just put it in because you have it and then it grows on you. Yeah. That's like a, it's a funny way to, now you just sample everything. So you just know what it, it doesn't matter anymore. It's just such a yeah. strange shift. But yeah, but it's like, I mean, you really have to like put in the effort to decide you're going to give something a chance because it's so easy to just move on to the next thing. That's right. Yeah. That's true. It's like a sea of stuff out there. You yeah. Know? I mean, I try not to think about that when I'm making music because I don't want to. I don't want to be like, oh, I have to make this song interesting in the first five seconds, or no one's gonna listen to oh, it. Oh yeah, the <laughs> algorithm of like what you're supposed to do. Yeah, it's yeah. like with art, they're like, oh, you know, green painting or whatever. <laughs> you can yeah. never listen to that stuff because. Yeah, it's like this is a great painting, but it, it's not gonna translate to Instagram, so no one's ever gonna see it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That's. <laughs> Yeah, you can't do that. I mean, it's, yeah. but then you see like Instagram art and you're like, yeah. oh, like art fairs where so much of the stuff is like, yeah. that's just for selfies. Yeah. <laughs> that's the reason that piece exists. Totally. You know? And it works. It works. Yeah. 
there's those rare moments where somebody's making something good that also works really well with social media. Yeah. And then that stuff just blows up. Yeah, that's kind of like that word. That's like a pop song that's just really incredible. Mm-hmm. Like something that's simple or but just you know Yeah. It just takes it to another level somehow. Not easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's go. So when you moved to New York, when did you start? You were still making your own stuff. And then yeah. I remember when you DJed, uh, DJed, played music at my opening. Yeah. That was probably, what, 2002? That sounds about right. Yeah. And you were handing out cherry CDRs. Okay. Yeah, remember probably, they were yellow. Yeah, they were, yeah. <laughs> it was a CDR. Right, yeah, that would have yeah probably two thousand two, two thousand three, maybe. So but you like started right there there. pretty soon after moving here, or playing, yeah, or writing that stuff. Yeah, I guess so. I don't. Yeah, it would have been probably within the first year living in New York. We started making Ratatat records. How did you guys meet? We went to school together. Oh, at Skidmore. Skidmore. Yeah, it all goes back to Skidmore. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah, and then we yeah we kind of just got together and started making stuff in my apartment, um, in Brooklyn, and then yeah I don't know it was kind of like there was an immediate spark there, and we had like four songs and just made those CDRs and given out to people, and then it was a couple months went by of like nothing, and then it was like one week it was like those CDRs found their way into like label people's hands. And like, we got like three offers from three different labels, like all in the same week. <laughs> oh, like, that's crazy. Yeah. It was a like very whirlwind kind of thing. Do you um, think it was like one, they knew that the others were interested or something or it was just I don't think so. coincidence? I think it was just coincidence. Cause at the, we ended up signing with XL and the guy, the A&R there, Matt Thornhill that signed us, he, um, he found it through the, uh, uh, audio drives or maybe the evax website or something mm-hmm. i think there was like i'd put up like a link to like that was the new project or whatever and so then he found we had like a one song maybe on the on a, like a little website and he yeah. found that and was just like what is this so, did you have any experience navigating that whole label stuff no, none at all. On the job training, <laughs> yeah. It's like it's, it's like when you show at a gallery or something that you don't get taught, or at least back then, you have no idea. It's just yeah. like, okay, what's this paper? Like, what do I do? You know, it's so and and like the music business is so convoluted. It's very difficult to understand, and so you end yeah you end up having to like trust, take people's word for it. Like some they're like, oh, we've introduced you to this lawyer, and then the lawyer's like, well, this is how it works. Like. You you pay your lawyer ten percent of everything, right? you know, whatever they <laughs> yeah, right. whatever they tell you, and you're just like, well, that's what he says. Guess we have to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you just end up asking everybody that you come in contact with, like, well, how does this part work? And just getting various takes on everything. But it, it was yeah, it was definitely very confusing. And there's still parts of the the way you get paid, like the way royalty streams pay through and stuff that are mysterious to me like i feel like <laughs> even though i've been doing it for 20 years at this point there's still parts of it that i'm like huh are you sure it works like that right <laughs> like, yeah there's a fine print like you could get yeah. a master's degree and just understanding all that shit you know yeah it's which really, keeps you away from doing what you want to be doing yeah and that's yeah that's the thing it's like it's just so exhausting to try and stay on top of all that stuff so i mean i guess that's why there's a whole industry for managers and that kind of thing yeah too. so did you when you guys started writing stuff was that the combination, like, obviously, like, the reason that band, I think, resonated with so many people is, or your band, is is because of that, the combination of, you know, like, hip-hop and, like, you know, the guitar and, like, the sonic mm. sort of merging of that stuff that I don't think is, I think the reason it's really amazing and stands out is because there's not, there's nothing really like that. Mm. Did you, were you conscious of that or was it just like, oh, let's just throw this together you know, like, because he has a very distinct way of playing in a style, it seems, that, yeah, you know. Yeah, I think it was a, I mean, it was pretty just organic. Um, I was listening to a lot of hip-hop at that time. Yeah. I was just, like, obsessed with Jay-Z, particularly, but it just, and, like, Neptunes and Timbaland and Kanye West production, just, like, yeah, it was, like, kind of, like, all I was, like, right when I moved to New York. I think there was something about, like, moving to New York and like having already been into hip hop, but then like 
listening to it in New York just felt so appropriate. So yeah. that was just like, I don't know, just took a break from like guitar music for a while there and just pretty much exclusively listened to rap. Um, did you take, were you always writing your own stuff? Or did the, did your, like, because, you know, technically you have like Ratatat and then you have Evac. So there's mm -hmm. a different aesthetic slightly. And, yeah. you know, was it, were you keeping those things separate or were you just started writing primarily? I was kind of, I mean, stuff? I would still make stuff on my own all the time. And I think in the back, especially in the beginning, in the back of my mind, I was always like, oh, I got to finish another Evax record one of these days. But it just, Ratatat just took off so quickly and, um, and we didn't have a manager or anything, so I was kind of doing all that side of side of the the deal too, which was super time consuming. It's a lot and, of noise. Yeah, it was just like, yeah, I kept thinking like, oh, I'll I'll get back to Evax one of these days, and I just kept putting it off and putting it off. And I would make like a couple songs here and there, a couple songs here and there, and then, but I never like got enough together and got them finished enough to want to release it. Um, and by yeah, by the time I had enough songs, I would be sick of the the ones that i'd made right, earlier right now, i gotta do so, something yeah. new yeah yeah so it was a lot of that and then yeah it, yeah it just became such a all-consuming project that there wasn't time for anything else yeah i'm <laughs> i'm guessing that w the touring schedule was probably pretty exhausting yeah and fun yeah yeah it was yeah it was definitely but i mean we started touring like 2003 i think was the first one um, and then usually it would be like you'd put out an album and then tour for a year, maybe two years, and then you'd put out the next record. And oh my God, so, <laughs> so much touring. Yeah, and a lot of and usually it'd be like five weeks at a time, and then yeah. you'd come home. But then like as we started having more success and more demand, then it would they would start like booking the five week tours like back to back, so you'd do five weeks in the u.s and come home and have like a couple days and then it'd be five weeks in europe and then come home and then it'd be like time to go to australia <laughs> oh my god well at least you weren't bored yeah it wasn't boring that's for sure were you writing to do you write on the road not or is much. it harder to do I, w I wrote some stuff here and there but we didn't really we didn't really write ratatat songs on the road i might work on like some of the remixes or um uh, there was like i remember one tour in europe i I just made like a whole bunch of like harpsichord songs. Yeah. And, like, never figured out what to do with them, but I just like try and find things to do to like keep myself busy during the day on long drives or whatever. And, um, I, will, I when we were touring, I'd always really miss the studio experience. I think that's, I was always kind of more excited about creating new things. So yeah. being on the road all the time, it was like, I just needed something to, to like get that out of my system. Right. And when did you, outside of just the stuff you're doing with the recording, when did you start like producing stuff? Um, so, I mean, I started doing like those, the Ratatat mixtapes. So it like remix, get like acapellas from rap singles and then mm -hmm. just make my own music to it and do like these remixes. So that was kind of like the early experiment and kind of how I figured out like, oh, maybe I could actually like produce records or yeah. like or like i don't know i guess the idea of a producer in hip-hop is pretty different than it is in other genres of music I mean, there's a million ways to be a producer but um started getting into that through the remixes and then i was i did a bunch of songs with my friend uh who's the rapper despot mm -hmm. um so that was yeah so that was some of the early experiences with like hip-hop production and then kid cuddy reached out I don't know what year that would have been, probably like 2006 or seven or something. And we did a couple songs on his record, his first album. Um, and I was kind of like, I, I didn't have, I know that like one of those songs like really blew up and has yeah gone on to have like a long life and stuff. But at the time I didn't really, when he first reached out, I didn't know who Kid Cudi was or anything like he wasn't right. like a star yet. And now he's, gone on to have this whole thing and the thing started like the ball started rolling pretty quickly with him and I was kind of like hoping it was going to lead to like a lot of other opportunities in that world but like not not much else happened for a while like a couple years later I did one song with Jay-Z um and then it was like nothing for a while and then 
just like four years ago, maybe like I would kind of like um, have conversations with Kid Cudi here and there. Like every couple of years, he would like hit me up and just say hello or something. And then like four years ago, he he was working on the, the album with Kanye, the Kid See Ghost record. And he kind of called me up like super last minute. It was like they, the album was coming out in like five days. And he was like, <laughs> oh, I want you to work on this album. Like, can you come to L.A.? Oh, my God. When do you want me to come? Tonight. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I hadn't heard at that point. I probably hadn't spoken to him in like five years. And all of a sudden it was like, come to L.A. tonight and make an album with Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> what, did you have stuff? Not like really. In, that was the thing. up your sleeve, or what? You just <laughs> I, had to come up with stuff on the on the fly. I had been. I mean, I had I, always working on music, so I had like lots of bits and pieces, but nothing that I was like, "Let me make beats for rappers." Really, right. so I was on the plane out there. I was like going through just like a couple of years worth of like little bits and pieces of ideas. I had been working on a bunch of like ambient music, and I was like, that was the stuff that I was like kind of more excited about. It was just more recent and. Uh, and I was like, but this is, what am I going to do with this? And like, <laughs> on a uh, rap record or whatever. So I had like, a, I made a couple of playlists on the plane. And one was like the ambient stuff. And one was like stuff that was a little bit more like hip hop beats that maybe something that I like made with Alec and, or Deathspot in mind um, that he didn't use or whatever. And then when I, and I was kind of thinking like, oh, I can, I'll just have to like play stuff off this rap playlist or whatever. And then when I got into the studio and it was my turn to the, play beats I like it was <laughs> it was like Kanye like I had just met him it was like you know it's such a overwhelming experience there was like so many people around and stuff and I had been like kind of sitting there all day and other people were doing stuff and and he eventually like I was like oh, okay you're trying to like play beats or whatever and I go to like hit play and then he's like wait I'm gonna play one song off the album before we listen to what you have and he puts on like uh, like the hardest, like heaviest, most like pumped up rap song I've ever heard, and it literally started with the sound of a chainsaw at that time. It was just like, Rrr! and he cranks up the stair- the the speakers to like the loudest level you've ever heard, and like, <laughs> and, like there's like probably thirty people in the room, and everyone's just like jumping off the chairs, like right. freaking out, right. and it, it plays the whole song, and then it ends, and he's like, "So what you got?" <laughs> <laughs> That's like a comedian going on so after Sam like, Kinison or something. It's like, <laughs> I'm looking at my playlist of like <laughs> rap beats that I was, thought were cool, and I was like, oh man. <laughs> uh, so I, like, I was like, last second, I was like, all right, I'm play something off the ambient playlist. Uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, really? For this, like, like, made total, you go like, that direction? Yes. I played this like spacey guitar thing that was just like improv and like very loose structure. And like, I got like amazing reaction oh really it killed. <laughs> yeah. it's like the perfect counterpoint to what just happened it yeah like, i was because i was like there's no way i can compete with that thing like i gotta just shift gears dramatically or this is never gonna work yeah like i'm just a weird guy like i'm gonna do something out or so, you know it's like totally yeah. 180 from what you just yeah heard. but totally. i'm always amazed that recently fairly recently because like you know we i think probably came up in like an electronic music era Mm -hmm. where it was kind of linear you know like it started off with like you know there would be drum and bass and then like ambient you know like all that that organic flow of of electronic music yeah and i'm always interested that like nowadays in contemporary i listen to a lot of it through my son you know like Mm -hmm. the contemporary like rap stuff is like there's so much of that in there or like they're it's much more diverse than it used to be where it was just you know the boom bap like the you know the 808 yeah. or the, like the jazzy hook or whatever and that it's gotten pretty diverse and kind of out there with some of the mainstream stuff as far as the sonics behind yeah it. i mean there's a whole i mean a lot of the like trap stuff it's like basically just like an ambient yeah loop with trap drums on <laughs> yeah but it's like it's like simultaneously more diverse and then also like more formulaic like there's right. there's this other lane of just like this formula works like there's these handful of drum sounds that like everybody uses and like something spacey and then we put it at half right. speed and then the chorus we put it at double speed or whatever and it's just like <laughs> you hear the same th- and it, it works it's like an it's like an easy payoff so it makes sense that like people revert back to that it's like it's it's worked a thousand times before it's gonna work again yeah but 
And a lot of times it's a dynamic of that rapper, like the voice with that, that yeah, becomes yeah. kind of yeah. like it's not just the voice, it's not just that spacey background sort of thing. It's the, totally. the merging of it, you know, that yeah. like, oh, that kinda that kinda works, you know. Yeah. I mean you can hear bad versions of it, but Yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean I think there's great stuff within that formula and, and terrible stuff within that with formula. With like I everything mean, else, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. And I think just the hip hop's been around so long now too that people have like basically tried everything yeah (laughs) right it's all it's kind of like electronic yeah that's the weird thing i feel like i think our generation of like growing up through like seeing that stuff evolve you know yeah because electronic music used to it just went from it's it's almost like in 20th century art you know seeing like cubism then minimalism and you know abstract expression and like all that kind of like it was so linear because each thing was so new Mm -hmm. and then at some point it just postmodern it just became everything all at once and it's like now we'll just (laughs) mix all these different parts together which is kind of cool yeah it is kind of cool but it can be kind of disorienting at times too because you're just like where where, you know it's all just like different versions of everything it's like every flavor at once but yeah it's like a weird soup every time you go but it's like sometimes it feels like we're just circling back around like we're in this kind of swirling pool that we keep ending up back yeah (laughs) to where we were like you take a little ladle out and there's different flavors or whatever but it's all that same like yeah (laughs) mess it's like a weird yeah you know stew yeah it doesn't feel like a progression anymore it feels like a (laughs) <laughs> yeah and also there would be the thing of like bands that kind of reach back for a record like they'll mm-hmm. get interested in a certain genre and like explore like disco or who knows whatever yeah psych rock or something but now it's like each track is like a sample or you right. know, it's not like a deep exploration as much it's yeah. kind of like well this will be our funk track this will be our disco track this will be our you know ballad crooner yeah. track and it's it's so compartmentalized in a way yeah that's but you're right it like the thing that i really loved about so i don't even know the name of the record like your latest oh, it's just self-titled okay record. good that's that helps me because <laughs> <laughs> i was like did i forget but is that it works so well together it gets a record and mm. the videos you did for it are so connected in a way like there's mm. elements that that resonate through the different videos so mm. I imagine you really thought about that as a group of work. Yeah. I mean, the music definitely came first and then the videos came after. And then I had a couple ideas for videos. And then at some point I was like, oh, I'm just going to make a video for every song. So I think uh, some of the ideas later, late in the game, I was a little bit like, can I stretch this for three minutes and make it work? <laughs> um well, how yeah. does how do those videos relate to the videos that are the videos in your show now? Uh, so some of them are like a similar format, like the so the the I'm not I made like three videos for for art purposes rather mm-hmm. than music videos now, and um, they're all the same format, which is like a collage of images, and it's a slow pan from left to right across like a cityscape basically and it's sort of like an invented space made out of a collage of of actual photographic images or videos so um so i ended up kind of using that same technique for some of the music videos just because um i had put so much i'd put so many hours into it already and like had these things and i was like well i need music videos i have these videos maybe this could work yeah um and then, yeah and it was yeah, no, I think it's kind of mixed results. I think those I think those videos actually work much better in like the art context in a gallery, like with projection and having having some control over the installation of everything, and um, and even probably not as support for like a, a song with like a pop structure. But um, the sound in the video installations has all been really ambient, yeah, kind of like drone noise pieces that. Um, don't take too much attention away from the the video kind of just give you like a an atmosphere so that's what i was gonna say it's like atmospheric yeah because i saw a video of the video and right and the room sound and you can sort of it it just built a little bit of an atmosphere without it being Mm -hmm. like the song you know what i mean yeah totally 
But the cool thing about those videos too is they the vignettes, like as I I noticed that like one with the barber poles mm. is all Japan, or at least there's a lot of Japanese writing in that one. Yeah, and then there's yeah. another one where it seems like it's based in China, like because mm-hmm. there's. And then maybe one in Vietnam or or Thailand or somewhere else, possibly uh, or or Pakistan maybe. The the new video is is all from Pakistan. It's Pakistan, uh, the one that's in the gallery now. Um, but yeah, the so there's a, there is a barber pole one from Japan and a barber pole one from China. Oh, from China. Well, too. well covered <laughs> subject matter there. <laughs> no, well, it's probably, kind of hypnotic. I think I probably know more about barber poles in asia than anybody on the planet did point. you you found all those you, you yeah, sought yeah. them out yeah totally. i was on a trip in japan um i don't know how long ago that was five years ago or something and i just i was spent all my time like walking around and just got interested in in the various barber pools for some reason i don't know and then just took all those images on my iphone and then it was kind of like i had an idea about how i wanted it to actually look so I like got a camera that was going to do the thing I wanted to do, but then I ended up going to China rather than Japan when I went to like film it properly. So yeah. I just ended up with two separate collections of clips. They're pretty. I've always been fascinated by Barbara. Ball. They're so hypnotic. And yeah, weird. <laughs> There's not much like it. No, it's a, it's a pretty singular thing. Like like it's kind of an international language too. Like pretty much everywhere you go, like that that means you're getting your haircut means haircut yeah. but didn't it originally mean like bloodletting, bloodletting. or something yeah yeah, it's yeah. Got a sordid past <laughs> apparently yeah it was it was supposed to be the visual of blood leaving the body but it was yeah. i guess barber shops and bloodletting shops were the same business <laughs> listen i've had a bad cut before where yeah. my neck did a little bloodletting <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it was right on target I hope you didn't have to pay extra for that <laughs> no i didn't i didn't tip well on that one <laughs> i remember it though but yeah, those yeah. poles, there's something really cool about that. And then the yeah. angles that you're doing it. And like, there's that, the the cool thing about it is you feel the collage element, but it's hard to navigate it because of the movement mm-hmm. and the sound. So you just, it kind of washes over you. Whereas I feel like collage can sometimes be very illustrative of the collage elements of it, yeah. you know? Yeah. With those ones, I, I was trying to kind of hide the, the seams of the collage enough so that so that it's not distracting. Like I didn't want it to look like a graphic design project. Right. And I think when you can, when it's obvious where the collages are, it's hard not to think of it in those terms. But if you have tried to just get it over the level of like, not so that you're not thinking about that when you look at it, you're not thinking about where each part came from. It just becomes a singular thing. Yeah. Uh, but it's all your footage of different travels. Yeah. That's good. I, Cause I feel like, intrinsically if it's something that you've experienced visually and you're recording that no matter how you throw it together it's still that representation mm-hmm. of your eye which totally, yeah. binds the collage no matter how you do it formally into mm-hmm. your experience basically which yeah is cool. yeah because i mean like the first phase of all those projects is just going to a place that i'm not familiar with and spending yeah. like three or four weeks just on foot walking all day every day and finding things to film and and you, I, like I re, that's kind of like one of my favorite things in the world to do. So that's sort of I almost like created the whole set of projects just to have an excuse to do that. Right, <laughs> so, right. But it's like it, it's interesting just spending that amount of time, putting that amount of energy into something like that. Like how those ideas develop over time, and you start to like see these threads, and you start to like pick apart the visual language of a city, and like we start to notice like how I'm seeing this texture over and over in different ways and how that's connected to the culture and the climate. And, um, so I don't know. It's, that's kind of like what I, the enjoyment I get out of it is just like having, giving myself the the time and space to think about those things and like really, really indulge it and go deep and learn about a place, you know, not through like reading about it, but just right. through like, looking at stuff seeing it yeah yeah i feel like you feel alive in that sense because your your radar's up because you're not unfamiliar so you're actually mm-hmm. looking and experiencing new things yeah. whereas like if i walk from here if i walk around the city i can tune out most of it totally i don't yeah. look at the signs i don't really much yeah. uh, unless it really is different like there was a storefront on the way over here it said who's your who's your doggy and i was like oh i get it you know, like I noticed that, but there was probably yeah. like 5,000 other ones and I just didn't notice. You yeah. Know, I'm not looking. But when you go somewhere for the first time or you're 
in an unfamiliar place like that, your your senses are so heightened because you're just not unfamiliar. Yeah, it's got to be some sort of visceral like safety th- or like as humans, you're like, oh, what you know, I'm I'm somewhere I haven't been before, and you're you're yeah you're tuned up to it, and I feel like yeah, the same not, thing happens with music. Totally, yeah. When you hear something you're not familiar with, you know, the first time I heard mm. shamisen, I was like, what? Mm. Like, what is this? And you know, the the sort of or like you know, I've been I've gone to like. Um, like Zen meditations or like gone to temples and stuff where they're singing and I don't understand what they're saying, but it's just so beautiful, but yeah. so different Yeah, that I'm like hyper conscious of everything, you know? And yeah. that you, there's a feeling of like being more alive in those moments, I think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, I've tried to like do similar sorts of video projects in New York and it just doesn't really work because you can kind of dismiss everything like you you know why everything is the way it is you have like reasons and stuff for everything so it's like easy to like look at something and not be interested in it because you understand it yeah <laughs> yeah you're just like yeah i get that yeah. yeah and then you just end up developing these filters i mean like i do this like same walk from my studio to my apartment you know twice a day so it's there's all this stuff that you just don't even see anymore because it's you just know it's going to be there so you don't have to look at it <laughs> yeah i i it's funny when there was like someone talking about how oh in new york yeah you could you see people i think there was like a small like somewhere near where i live there was a small garbage fire just on the sidewalk mm. and like someone had photographed and posted it's like this is new york and this is people like walking by <laughs> they're not stopping and be like oh my gosh it's they're just yep yeah. and you just can tune that stuff out because yeah. you become so desensitized <laughs> to it you know yeah Totally. But I think creatively, you're always trying to get yourself to a place that feels mm. like when you travel, like it feels new, or you're looking for that new sound or the new image that, mm-hmm. you know, isn't just like a record going over and over again, like a broken record, you know? Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I, yeah, I think that yeah, walking through a foreign city or foreign country or something is, is a great way to tap into that sort of feeling. And I think with those projects, it's really fun too because I have that that period of time where I'm like discovering things through walking and filming and and just you know following my nose, not not really having any sort of plan or schedule going into it. But then there's another period of of discovery later when I have like I'll come home with like 600 or 900 clips or something from one of these trips, and then oh, like that's cool. going through that bit by bit and like finding relationships between like one image and another and then like other things start to happen within the editing process that a lot of times the videos end up taking like a wildly different turn than what i thought i was gonna do yeah um that's yeah it's kind of cool i mean i think it, that, that there's a nice like dichotomy there with the two different phases and then it's also the, the other nice thing is like so much of the work i do is just sitting at a laptop if i'm doing music or i'm doing video it's always sitting in front of a computer so right kind of like needed to invent this thing that i can do that requires walking around <laughs> yeah yeah so that's inherently part of the process it's like it's yeah. gonna be good for your eyes too do you yeah. get that thing because i do a lot of the pre-work for my stuff on the computer mm. and when i have those days like if i'm animating yeah like i stare at it so long that i start to see like double like the reverberating edge on things and it's like uh, uh, yeah i've definitely had that where it was too many hours in front of the computer and then like step outside and like looking at something in the distance. Oh, yeah. and it's just like a weird, like, whir, whir, whir. <laughs> yeah. Like you have to adapt to that. It's, it's yeah. tough. Um, do you th- having the gap? Well, two questions, having the gap between the, the evac stuff, does that re sort of like invigorate the process of writing for it? Or does it feel like it's on the same tracks? So you just, you've just gotten off the train for a little bit and then you come back in the train is the same route. Uh, I mean, it was there was definitely like an adjustment getting back on that track. I don't know, I, like I, I haven't listened to the old Evax record in a really long time, so I don't I don't know if that a I'm parking curi- lot. Yeah, I, I'm curious to see like how that listening to those two records back to back if it feels like there's much of a relationship there. There's a little bit. Yeah, I've done it. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> I'll put on. Like parking lot is from an era of certain music that once in a while I'd just dip into that stuff. Mm, you know yeah. what I mean? And yeah. there was some there was some percussive elements that I felt like okay maybe transmuted a little bit. I mean it's obviously totally different. 
but yeah. you know, there's, you can feel that. I, I just, I'm interested in you of like having that experience of writing on your own for, you know, years. And then you go into this big sort of like band. Yeah. Different. I would imagine than like bedroom producing in a way where you're out playing these huge shows and stuff and then jumping back into this sort of more meditative seemingly from the outside. I mean, I think initially when I went back to just like making stuff on my own, it, it was a lot of it was sounding like ratatat and I would get like excited about songs that had more of that sound and then come back to it a month later and I'd be like, I'd be like, if it's, you know, it's, it's too, it just felt too similar yeah. and it was like, felt like second rate ratatat songs or something. So I was like, either I made a couple of albums of worth of material that I just ended up deciding not to put out. Cause I was like, ah, it's not, it's not like different enough. It's not, I wanted something that really felt like a new take, a new direction. Um, and yeah, I mean, a lot of the self-titled record then ended up being uh, um, stuff I wrote during the pandemic and just had so much studio time. So it was like kind of just cranking through ideas. And then a lot of it was also like outtakes from ideas I had pitched for Kanye records and didn't end up landing there so it was like well i really like this song <laughs> like, yeah. so i'm gonna use it yeah it could yeah. be an instrumental it was, so there's a lot of stuff where stuff that i was initially imagining with a rapper on it or something and then i was like is it you know experimenting with like adding more like lead melodies or something to see if i could turn it into something that worked as an instrumental so a bunch of the songs had that that track um, yeah well speaking of the collaboration thing was working on the the donda stuff crazy or was it was it the same kind of intense <laughs> environment? So, so intense, yeah. I can't imagine the, yeah. that kind of pressurized. It seems like it would be like, you know, pressure cooker. Situation. Yeah. I mean, it, I, I don't know. Actually, I, I've done a lot of studio sessions with, with Kanye now, and it's it's always different. Um, it's usually very intense, but sometimes it's like pretty chill too. I don't know. Yeah. It's like you never know it's so hard to predict what it's going to be like <laughs> I can that's, imagine. The, that's the consistent thing is that you never know what it's going to be like and you kind of just have to be down for whatever <laughs> well that's what's cool about the tracks though is that you don't know you yeah. know what i mean like yeah my son was looking forward to that record coming out when when you know we listened to it, it was like oh you just didn't know what the next song was going to be like yeah and i know he works with different producers and yeah stuff. yeah Totally. But that's not ever in your head, probably, right? Because you come to it with the th stuff that you come to, and no one probably knows how it's going to weave together into like a piece. Yeah, nobody knows, and it's you're really like tested along the way because like things just change dramatically from day to day, and you have to just be open to like maybe you spent like weeks like perfecting this one song, and everyone thought it was the greatest thing, and the next day it's like crossed off the track list and you're like what that yeah. song that was the best song <laughs> like everybody loves that song that's not even on the album anymore <laughs> yeah but it's just it, it changes it changes every single day but i, I mean and that's what's so fun about it you like you just learn so much in that environment because the the level of people that come through like the talent that comes through is just off the charts yeah and you get to work with everybody and yeah for me I, at some point i mean you can't really like get too attached to anything because yeah like your favorite song might be gone the next day and then it's back and it sounds completely different and you just have to like i think early on i just decided to like not be attached to anything i was right. like i'm just gonna have the experience and get whatever i can from the experience and if you know if everything i worked on gets cut at the last minute so be it <laughs> yeah I, I could still get to like have the experience and walk away with that and right everything i learned from it um and you still have your own stuff that you decide when it's cut and when it's not. So yeah, that totally. you can invest in. Yeah, I think if I was if I was strictly a producer, it would be pretty heartbreaking. Some of those trips to like have worked know. so hard. And I don't know how those guys do it. Out. Maybe they're just yeah. doing it so much for different people that you just get used to it. You're like, oh, that didn't work, because yeah. you hear stories about a certain track that was written for one person, and yeah. then a year later, someone else hears it. They tweak it and it becomes this huge thing so yeah i mean I, I think so much gets left on the cutting room floor too i mean I think some of those some of the big producers like they just they make they work so quickly like um got, got through kind of got a chance to work with a lot of 
the guys that are doing like the, the big hip hop records and it's just they'll just like crank out beats like yeah. left and right like and you know if one in ten gets used for something like it's still it's a good day's work <laughs> <laughs> that's it's yeah. pretty crazy I mean did, it doesn't change the way you work at all seeing like the way these other people work oh definitely like dramatically yeah I mean I've I've just learned so much from getting to work with other pretty like we I got to spend a week at Timberland's studio in Miami working with him and he was just like holding court and showing all the there was a bunch of other producers there and he was just showing us how he does it and it was like how do they have enough time I don't some of these guys they have such (laughs) fertile extracurricular lives I'm like how do they have time to like knock out all this stuff yeah I I don't know people are capable of incredible things I think so (laughs) yeah and I guess you know how it is when you when you the longer you work you know the more you can get in a rhythm of being able to get into the zone you know yeah yeah so definitely. i think some people are just they know how to make it happen you know yeah and they set up that area of their life to just do it yeah definitely yeah yeah it's yeah it's i, I definitely have like a renewed interest in collaboration I mean, ratatat was a pretty like insulated thing for the most part like we, there's only a handful of times that we really worked with anybody outside of the two of us so um getting to work in these like highly collaborative environments is just like kind of blew my whole world open yeah i mean everything from like really specific techniques like programming drums or a certain way or something but also especially seeing the way Kanye works and his approach to like creating a body of work and all the different phases that it goes through and how he refines this thing. And, um, I mean, it is so unpredictable that in some ways it's hard to like find a, to imitate the method, but, right. but it's, you st- I mean, you still just learn so much just watching it happen. Yeah. You just see how different people approach it. Yeah. You know, the mindset of it, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, that whole like, hop on a plane, five hours, we got to get going. I can't imagine. <laughs> that seems so, I, I mean, exciting, but also like, oh my God, you know. Yeah. Does it make you feel like in your studio that you're just, you got to put some stuff in your pocket? You know what I mean? And be Always be kind of on working in case you get a call? Yeah, pretty, I mean, pretty much. I, I know I started carrying my passport with me when I went on those trips because it would be like, I'll come to LA it'll probably just be like three days and then like three months later you're still <laughs> oh my god <laughs> and then it would be like you're out there and he's like oh we, well we gotta go to Switzerland or something like, I didn't even bring my passport like, how are we gonna do that <laughs> oh that's crazy yeah I mean it's a that's a pretty it seems like a fun thing to be involved in though you know? yeah. yeah and then you fun. can since you're doing your stuff you can own that and work in that pace and you know yeah it's really yeah it's important to have have that balance happening too i think because it's otherwise it could yeah like i was saying before it can just be pretty heartbreaking yeah to, to see the the stuff that gets left behind like i think like almost all my favorite stuff that i've made for kanye hasn't been released <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> you keep it though right yeah i mean i like if it's ideas that i can use for my own thing yeah but I don't know, there's also, like, sometimes we'll pull up songs from, like, three years ago and be like, all of a sudden they'll be like, oh, that one's on the track list today or yeah. whatever. So it's like, all right, glad, never I know. glad I didn't take that beat and give it to someone else. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so well, what are you working on these days? Um, well, so I just put that show up in Chinatown, um, which is the, the video from Pakistan. And How long is it up? It's up till July 16th. Um, I think the galleries, I think they have the video open every day from like six to, or from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Okay. Uh, and then there's two silkscreen prints that go along with the video that are in the, the space next door, which is, it's locked up on weekdays, but open on weekends, but you can see it through the glass regardless. Um, and yeah, and now I'm just getting back into music. I just, I don't know, yesterday I was working on a beat for this reggaeton producer <laughs> nice it's like it got kind of reached reached out out of nowhere and i was like oh this is the kind of music i don't know anything about at all <laughs> so that could be interesting so yeah i don't know Just, did you go into a in a research mode i mean i love reggaeton no uh, 
Not really. I still don't really. I was, he just sent me like some stuff to work with and was like, do something with this. Oh, that's I, cool. I was kind of, yeah, just let it. I mean, I, he, he told, he talked about some of the artists he was working with. So I like searched their names and stuff and it would be like somebody I'd never heard of, but then I went to their <laughs> Spotify page and they literally had a song with over a billion plays. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I should know who this person right, is. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's impossible these days to know everything, you know? Yeah. That's the difficult thing. And nothing makes me feel more old yeah. than when my son <laughs> is listening to someone. I look at the artist and I'm like, no clue. And then I'll go on Spotify and be like, oh my God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's a huge amount of people. Yeah, it's yeah. crazy. And that's, you know part of getting old i think yeah you gotta embrace it a little bit yeah <laughs> <laughs> there's always something to find and yeah. sometimes i was still to this day you know find out about an artist from like you know the 20s or the 50s or the 70s like some artist that i just missed yeah like, how did i miss that yeah <laughs> and i'm a teacher i should know you know but it's yeah. just an, impossible to know everyone I know. but it's cool it's nice that you can still discover that stuff definitely i, I got really into the to Rudy column. Oh, that's that so stuff? funny that you mentioned them. Yeah. Yeah. Because, uh, the band that I was in, we once got a review. I don't know if it was wire. We got reviewed somewhere, maybe Chicago readers. And mm. they mentioned, they were like the guitarist mm. would clearly listen to a lot of to Rudy column. Oh, really? <laughs> Almost in like a negative tone. Like, yeah, like yeah. He clearly I'd never heard of him. I was right. like, what the hell? I'd never even heard I don't of this know band. If maybe it just didn't come to the U S that much. Cause I had never heard of it until like two years ago. And yeah. Discovered that stuff i heard like a song randomly somewhere and i assumed it was contemporary because it just sounded really fresh yeah it's really cool like, wow, this record came out in the 80s <laughs> like what the i know hell? it's weird right but then when i talk to people in europe about that band they're just like it's like the seminal band that everyone has known about for decades or whatever. right so, uh, yeah i was i felt like oh my god that's that's bad that i'm being compared to it but i've never even heard of it in my yeah. life. but if i didn't <laughs> read that yeah i never would have gone right. and bought like i had to find it was hard to find it was like a compilation of or of stuff of theirs but it okay. wasn't easy to find yeah but yeah it was pretty cool yeah but there's always those those bands that you just you know you heard, you've heard the name forever but you never bothered to like listen to the record or yeah. something and yeah You're like oh this is pretty good yeah <laughs> <laughs> like can was like that for a while i didn't mm. I had heard the yeah. name for yeah, just like when I was a lot younger and at a certain point I like listened to it and I, I liked it. I didn't, it wasn't like something I was going to listen to all the time. Yeah. But, but I respected like what it was, you know, like a the boredom stuff too. Stuff it's like, like you, p people talk about the band, like they might be talking about can and then you, it used to be you'd go into the record store and let's see all the can records and you're like where do i start and if you pick the wrong one oh you pick yeah the one that's like 20 years into their career and they're taking a <laughs> detour down a different road you're just like i don't know about this band like that happened to me with the kinks when i was in high school like people i looked up to were like oh you gotta check out the kinks they're like the best band of all time or whatever and and i went to i found one of their records at the goodwill for like a dollar or whatever and it was like some one of the like 80s records that was like just a bummer and i was like yeah, this like, is the band that everybody likes these are, they're and not like, good years later like heard the stuff i should have heard and like it became like my favorite band <laughs> yeah yeah that happens a lot i did that with return to forever because like mm -hmm. it's like you know like chick korea's like jazz stuff that oh, got okay. very 80s ish but mm -hmm. the earlier stuff was kind of i mean it was still a little new agey but you know it's kind of cool yeah now to listen to but i picked a late record and i was like this is terrible you know and then later on i i figured it out yeah but that just you know just goes to show you got to do the deep dive totally. to really understand someone or, you need, or something you really need like the curate curated playlist or something you need somebody yeah. to be like listen to waterloo sunset first <laughs> right right like this is the good stuff yeah you can break off from there yeah <laughs> that's cool well so you got the show coming or the show's up now the show's up now yeah that just opened uh, last week and yeah i don't know and whenever you direct people to to evax mm. where do you direct them like what's the best way for people to listen to it uh, or are they I just going to stream it yeah it's it's on all the streaming sites um, it's hard, right? Because like yeah. some people will tell me like, oh, I see your book is available on Amazon, but I don't want to buy from Amazon, you know? Yeah. So where do I get it? It's, and you say, oh yeah, I get it from here, but it's tough. It's available in a lot of different ways and some people prioritize, you know? Yeah. But it is on vinyl. It is on vinyl. Yeah. You can get the vinyl on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I, I mean, it's on like Bandcamp. I, I don't know. Honestly, I don't even know like where the most reasonable place to buy music or to support music is. Just Google um, it. I, I use Spotify. I know it's terrible, but it's convenient. And hopefully yeah. somebody will come up with something better <laughs> <laughs> at some point. But um, yeah, that's the best it's, way. It's, it's in all the usual places. Cool. Well, thanks for... It was great to talk. Thanks for taking all this time. Yeah, thanks so much for coming out here. Yeah, it was good to catch up. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Cool. cool. Sound and Vision is recorded, edited, and produced by myself, Brian Alfred. You can find out more about the podcast by going to soundandvisionpodcast.com. Find images on Instagram at soundandvisionpodcast, and you can find out about my work on my website, which is brianalfred.net, or on Instagram at Alfred Studio. Many thanks to Evan. It was great to talk to him. The song you just heard, the track, is on his new record, relatively new. Um, the self-titled Evax record. Check that out. You can find all his music on Spotify or wherever else. Um, many thanks to him. And check out his other band if you're not familiar with Ratatat. Amazing band. And uh, all the music he produces too, is, which is incredible. Many thanks to Golden Artist Colors for their sponsorship. And many thanks to Fulcrum Coffee as well. 
and the intro outro music of course thanks to evan for that and michael lovett for the introduction you can support sound and vision in a couple different ways one is by leaving a rating and review wherever you listen to it another would be by picking up why i make art the new book based on the sound and vision podcast which has writing by myself we should catch here way writes the foreword to it he is uh, the host of Song Exploder, West Wing Podcast, Home Cooking, a bunch of other podcasts. New ones called Partners, which is really great. He writes a thoughtful foreword to the book, and there's many images in there and artist features, quotes, and sketches from the sketchbook. I'm really proud of it. It's only 25 bucks. You can get it from Altelier Editions or anywhere you get books online. So that's another great way to support the podcast. And just to listen and tell a friend, or share a picture, or spread the word. Uh, Many thanks to you, the listeners, and got some great episodes coming up, so stay tuned.